final talk for the day is Kelly Lee. Would you like to come up, Kelly? Sure. Introduction. <laughs> okay. First up, how cute is that? That's what you get for staying to the very end, to the last session. Getting through all those other species, I'm going to flood you with flagship, iconic, cute, fluffy pictures. Um, so this is about the Blue Mountains Koala Project. I'm from Science for Wildlife, which is a relatively young charity. It's a research organisation that does applied and innovative research, partnering with land managers and communities and aiming for conservation outcomes. So I'm going to take you through the process I went through in terms of working out what citizen science approaches we wanted to take for this project as a case study um, and the results that we got out of it. So the Blue Mountains Koala Project is about assessing the distribution of koalas right across the greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area, which is a combination of reserves, national parks and karst reserves that makes up a million hectares. So it's a really big area and one of the first questions was, well, how do we survey one million hectares? Where do we start? Uh, we can't survey all of it. We don't have the resources. Some of it's just not suitable for koalas, or so I thought, at least. Um, and so we just had to assess how we approach that. We had a bunch of research questions, which I'll go into in a minute. So one of the first things I did was looked at a map. This is 10 years of historical data for koala sightings. Um, and you can see all the red dots, basically, sightings there. They're all around developed areas. So we want to know where they were elsewhere. So one of the questions was, is this data useful to us at all? Can we use it? Um, and what role can citizen science play in trying to fill those gaps? So the trade-offs, and a lot of people have spoken about this today, and thank you, Caitlin, for looking at broad and deep engagement and everything. So you're pretty familiar with this large-scale versus small-scale engagement. So you can either go large numbers of people, often with quite simple tasks, um, and the research reviews from a lot of projects have shown you often just get single engagement from those um, participants versus going for smaller numbers, more in-depth training and more complex tasks. So that's a bit of a trade-off. It's not black and white. You can end up somewhere in the middle. Um, so that's audience focused. And then another one is looking at the data quality. So when you go for that high level of awareness, really broad scale reach, you can get poor data quality out of it that may not be publishable um, unless you're really caref careful with your filtering. Or you can go for lower reach but quality data, so coming out of that intensive training. So it pretty much relates to the amount of um, resources you can put into your training and, and what your focus is as well. So in terms of the objectives of the project, as well as the distribution mapping, we have more detailed things. So nobody really knows anything about the koalas in this region. So they're a threatened species. It's a world heritage area, but they haven't been mapped for a very good reason, because it's really tough terrain and they can be really hard to see. Um, so we also wanted to look at the ecology of koalas. What trees do they use? You know, what species are they focusing on? What are their home range sizes, genetics, disease, the works, basically. And then another objective was community engagement right from the start. So we didn't want to do research and have academics or students going in and then taking that knowledge away, publishing it, and nobody really sees it. So part of the objective of the project is to get local people involved, get them collecting the data, start building knowledge and capacity within the local community so that when we pull out, hopefully there's some conservation actions and some entrenched behaviours within organisations on the ground. So in looking at those trade-offs, we decided, well, I'm actually going to do all of them <laughs> within the one project, so broad, deep, you name it. Um, and that was a targeted approach because we had different research questions that all of those different approaches would suit really well. So the first one in terms of the broad engagement, general community, we did that just to encourage reports of sightings, so opportunistic sightings of koalas. If you see a koala, please report it to us. So that gave us a start point to say, well, we know a koala's been seen in this habitat, even though it was by a road. Let's survey that habitat in other places. Um, so, and it also gives us an idea of the regions that koalas might be occupying as well. So still with that data bias, though. <coughs> and then the next step was zooming down into deeper engagement. Um, and developing educational tools and workshops that we targeted particularly at bushwalkers, at um, naturalists, at canyoners, people who were capable of going off track in the Blue Mountains <coughs> or on track remote areas, ground truthing habitats and looking for koalas for us. So we didn't want the general public engaged in that because it's not safe. There's lots of cliffs and you only want competent people out there. And at the next level down again, we did training days where people could participate in the ecological data collection. 
um, so they could come and learn how to use a GPS, navigate in the bush, use telemetry equipment and come out regularly and radio track our koalas and collect identification data on the koalas and also on the tree species that they're using and various measurements. So some of the tools we used, um, depending on the data we were collecting, really broad, so media for general outreach included newspapers, television, magazines, community newsletters, social media as well, just to get word out to say, hey, we're interested, please report sightings to us. Um, in terms of the workshops, we did a training booklet. So the thing about the World Heritage Area is it's one of the main values behind its listing is that it's World Heritage because of the diversity of eucalypts. I don't know how many people have tried to key out eucalypt species, but it's not a fun thing to do, particularly stringy barks. So part of what we do is translating that information. So each particular site we work in, we'll pull out really characteristic trees that you can identify through bark or leaves or something, produce a little handbook, along with pictures of koala poop. They've got what we call the wrinkly sphincter effect, which is really diagnostic. When the poop comes out of the wrinkly sphincter, you get stripes along it, which possum poos don't have. Um, so interesting things like that. People get really excited then about looking for wrinkly sphincter poops and scratch marks. Um, and then people could go out and ground truth habitats and look for poop for us. I'd set up a mapping portal on the website and used iNaturalist for that we had basically zero uptake from that, apart from students that I was co-supervising from Sydney Uni who I made use the mapping portal. No, nobody else, we didn't have a single volunteer use that. Um, but we do now have groups that are interested, wildlife carers and other groups who we've trained up that want an app, so we're about to just put out a simple <coughs> app sheet, white labelled app as part of it. Um, and yeah, so the phone app is on its way, we haven't evaluated that yet. So a bunch of different tools to get people engaged. And in terms of the design, follow both a spatial and temporal design. So with a really broad scale engagement, we're covering a really big area. So at the moment, we're not trying to do the whole World Heritage Area because it's massive. So focusing on Southeast Wallamai National And then for the ecological studies where we need more intense engagement and more data, we're focusing on one side at a time. So we've got about two years of data Expanded into Janolan Caves, Canangra Boyd as well. So that's one side at a time.